Thank you for inviting me to give an update of where we are with our development of uh, Quadrum Institute and how we fit in, I think, with your plans to develop the Centre of Excellence for ME. So, um, this is my second talk here, I think, and I think those of you who have heard me talk about some of this before, I apologise, but our plans have moved on and we're moving towards completion now of the building. And you'll see some of the excitement uh, I feel about the way the research is going within the Institute. And you'll hear from me and from Simon later how that fits in with the plans to deal with ME. I'm always surprised when I hear the statistics on ME, just about how little is still known about the, uh, the condition. And hundreds of thousands of people are affected. And note with interest your comment that a bit of exercise and a bit of this, that and the other might be good enough for the government. But I know it's not good enough for us in terms of how we understand the disease and what we want to do with it. It's part of what we want to do with the new institute and you'll see some of the focus is on microbiome research, is but how we can reduce that to practice and principle, and how we can get some interesting hypotheses to test through the system. So, again, we, we don't know very much about ME in terms of the underlying etiology, the disease state itself. One of the things we're interested in is this interaction of microbiota and this dysbiosis. We know from some interesting clinical trial results that are coming out with anti-CD20 antibodies, there's clearly an immunological role here, and we know that there's a, an important contribution made by the microbiota to that cell signaling interaction and how um, that supports the evidence, if you like, that there's an immune regulatory network here involved. But beyond that, we're awaiting really good classical hypothesis testing experiments to put through the system so that we can actually understand how the system works. Now, you've introduced Norwich as a theme. Norwich is a great place to do research, and it's one of those uh, still undiscovered gems of research. You think about research powerhouse in the UK being part of this golden triangle between Cambridge, Oxford, and London. I want to suggest there's another important arm to that, which is Norwich, and the Norwich Research Park itself is an important place where research is done. It's one of the largest single-site concentrations of research in this plant microbial genomics food space. Um, 3,000 scientists, four big institutes, all set within a kilometre of each other. So those of you from the States will understand what I'm saying. It's more like one of your research campuses with a hospital on board uh, than anything else we've got in the UK. And it certainly has that feel to it, um, to when I've looked at um, certain of those bigger sites in the, in the US and I look at the Norwich Research Park, I think, hmm, I could almost close my eyes, blink, and I'd be back in North Carolina. So, load of major institutions, so the four institutes, the hospital, um, and the university itself, loads of companies on sites, 12,000 employees associated with it. As I've said, 3,000 researchers, 14,000 students. There's a big biomass of research active students producing world-renowned, world-class research. Um, some of the institutes you might have heard of include John Innes with its plant focus. The Earlham Institute is the BBSRC um, core-funded institute that deals with genome, genome sciences, and bioinformatics. And as I say, BBSRC are a big player and largely involved with the support for the work on the Norwich campus. There's a map of what the campus looks like. So if you look up to the, uh, in the middle of the right, there's Quadrum Institute. That's the old IFR building. And then if you look down, slightly to the left, there's a new Quadrum building, the big green patch. That's where we're moving to. And this is a point that's been made to me. In order to get from where we are at IFR, we have to cross the road, and this was a barrier to research, apparently. It stopped the students. Students can only be driven around these days. They've forgotten how to walk on So that, that ability, new building, having crossed the road, we're now more central to John Innes, the Bob Champion. These are medical research buildings, and closer to the hospital. So this is a fantastic uh, integration of where we're going research-wise. So here's the artist's impression of the building. Why Quadrum? So Quadrum is, it sounds like a name produced by a committee, a camel, but the quad reflects the four partners, the UEA, the IFR, uh, the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, and the BBSRC, so the four partners coming together. That's an artist's impression of the building. And it really wants to put um, 
the science we do at the heart of this unique cluster of linking that food, microbiome, health aspects of research. And we want to work alongside the food and pharma industries to look at new um, translational outputs. So we, we think... We hope, our aspiration, our goal, our vision, is to create a, a step change in this food and health research. And one of the things we certainly know is that food has an impact on the microbiome, and the microbiome has an impact on cell signaling, the immune system, the gut-brain access, things you've no doubt heard about, things going forward that we've actively got to be researching to understand that connection between food and health. And we want to accelerate the innovation that's coming through this pipeline at the new institute. So here are the research themes. You probably know there are quite two large industries that actually dominate this, this space. There's the food area of research, with its own metrics and its own business model. There's the health area, which has a lot of big pharma and biotech input. And here you can see where this is going. We see ourselves as, as being at that interface on this Venn diagram between the two different, um, certainly different commercial models, um, with the same sort of goals and outputs to try and increase our health. And we see ourselves at the interface between the food and health sectors. And we're going to bring together, in the new institute, um, all aspects around that food and health agenda. Understanding the gut microbes, food safety, population health, food in innovation aspects. Bringing together the microbiologists with the clinicians together in the same building. And you'll see there's a little video at the end that explains how that will all work. With the gut biologists, the bioinformatics experts, the cell signaling experts, the immunologists. Together to address those big areas. One of the things that Norwich is very good for, it has a fairly static population. Uh, and, that enable, and it's an ageing population, as the West has in, in general as a theme. And that means we have a, a, a standing cohort of population that will be able to access medical records, lots of human genome information, lots of those metadata around health status. And we'll be able to integrate what we're doing with microbiome health. So we can feed into this at one level questions around, um, general questions about health disease states, and hopefully have good populations within which to analyse. Just a little bit about this other genome and us. We all know now that we're residents, uh, we have a resident population of microbial organisms that are important, uh, important players in our contribution to health. And they have uh, 10 or 100 fold more pathways producing enzymes, metabolites uh, that contribute to cell signaling in our gut and our skin that have all sorts to do with health and disease. But we don't quite know what that is because it's a new area of research, and one of our main goals is to address that. And I think there's all sorts of disease states uh, that we're interested in. We have to have a focus. Here are some of the things that we're discussing now about the way we, we take forward. Obviously, ME, CFS, but obesity is a big problem, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, and this gut-brain access thing that people are talking about, about how microbes can possibly influence our cognitive health. Whole load of issues there, um, but as I say, we want to be able to reduce this to principle and testing in, in, a, in the traditional hypothesis testing method with good solid science. So we want to secure this ability to fund this inter, interdisciplinary research. A big building, there are going to be um, 400 people in the new building, 40 principal investigators in that building, each leading their own research theme. It'll have clinical um, uh, it'll have a clinical section, a clinical trial section, so that we can actually focus on a number of disease states and actually do um, test work on the most important animals that we're interested in, and that's us, the human beings themselves. So we actually need to be able to deliver on this. So I'm really looking for not only excellence in science from the new institute, but also a delivery of that excellence into translational products. And that does mean that good connection between the basic scientists and the clinical scientists who are all in the same building. So we want to actually be part of your uh, of, of research into important biological questions. One of those is, of course, ME. We want to actually collaborate with the Norwegian scientists, and Simon will tell you more about this in his talk, no doubt, about how we can look 
not only at some of the basic aspects of research and the contribution perhaps played by the microbiome, but also actually through clinical intervention studies. So we have a grand picture and a grand design for this. I don't think we're being too ambitious. I just hope we're being ambitious enough to deliver on this. So we like to think of the Institute working in this problem solution hypothesis area for a number of disease states. So we want to have this center of excellence that combines excellence in basic research with excellence in clinical delivery. And we want to be able to provide new insights into disease states such as ME. One of the important things about new and emerging uh, sciences such as the understanding the microbiome, the sciences around it, is that they sometimes escape standardization of protocols that allows um, direct comparison between experiments done in site A with site B. So we've got to work on standardization approaches. And again, I know Simon is very keen to establish um, not only those wet work experimental approaches, but also the clinical way those experiments are done and analyzed, but also the vast amount of data that we're going to be generated that puts us in line for understanding the big data concepts. So all of this has to be worked together in our, in our ambitious grand plan. So we need to embrace the big data. We need to embrace the clinical cohorts, and we need to understand the wet work that drives the basic science. So I now have, oh, I now have, I think, the video, which will show you the new building. I don't quite know how to access the video, but I know someone who does. Here it is. It's done it itself. Normally I'm struggling for a few minutes. So here's the new building, and I can say now we're, it actually more or less looks like this now. We're moving in, I think we take the build, take possession of the building in February next year, and we should be fully in place by um, the summer. So new building, fantastic new building. As I say, 400 people on board. Follow me through now. We should be swinging into the main entrance. And the first thing you'll see when you go in is the reception area and a sign saying endoscopy. So this is going to be one of the largest endoscopy centers, certainly in Europe. And it targets to do 40,000 patients through, subjects through a year. So that's 40,000 um, individuals coming for endoscopy. Just imagine what that means in terms of generating samples for basic clinical biomedical research. So a great opportunity. We like to view every patient potentially as a research patient so they could volunteer for the studies that we want to undertake. And in that big patient cohort, you can imagine we're going to get lots of interest. Upper floor from endoscopy is the clinical trials unit. So this will be an area devoted to carrying out clinical trials in specific areas. Now, it won't be limited to the food and health agenda or a microbiome related agenda, but it will certainly have a feel and a theme for delivering on that next so, again, a great area to carry out those structured research. And I, much, I've been lied to so much in my life by the animal experiments we've done that have not translated into human goods. So I think actually understanding what's happening in a clinical context with patients is a really good, sensible way to go. If you go up, next flight of stairs, although I think most people will be taking the lift at this stage, are two floors of basic laboratories. And they're following the standard format now for um, research labs. Large open plan spaces um, for both the office space and the, and the laboratories. Now the laboratories, the labs are going to be interdisciplinary, so that means we're going to have the clinical scientists up there doing their bits of research alongside the basic scientists, against, alongside bioinformatics experts people handling big data, people doing mass spectrometry experiments, people doing DNA sequencing, all in the shared laboratories. And hopefully, out of that, um, out of that uh, congregation of effort, there'll be some good ideas that will be bounced around. And the output of that ought to be able to, as I say, deliver on these next generation of translation products. And that's actually the end of my talk. I've whizzed through that. But I'm quite happy to take any questions quickly if there are any. Yes. Thank you. I have, I have a cheeky one here, Ian, that's been passed to me. It says, can we have a floor for ME research specifically at the Quadrum? How do we go about it? I've got some money in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> could, we, could we start? Yeah. 
<laughs> Simon, do you want to... Uh... Well, I think we have plans for expanding beyond what we're currently doing. So, I mean, the more space we can fill, the better, I think. Yeah. We're not proud. We'll take your money. Yeah. yeah I mean, I there are no constraints, I don't think, on space. So, I mean... It won't be in euros, though, if Britain gets its way, I'm afraid. <laughs> Some in Britain. No, I think it would be a great idea, Ian, to have something specifically, because I think many people would like to see, at least as a unit where something's going on, they can come visit open days and all that kind of stuff. The usual stuff that goes on with cancer now could go on with ME. <laughs> That's, that's right. The cancer model is quite a good model because they're, 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 they've actually had much more funding over the years, but they've sort of set the scene for what is possible. And within institutes, you often see cancer research themes or cancer research areas, uh, and those have their own identity, but it does allow them to do fund, specific fundraising, specific elements. And it's nice to have a tangible asset you can badge up and say, these are the labs associated with that ME-related work. And it does give it more credibility and is a focus, then, for research. There was a question over here, Richard. Hi. Um, I'm just asking a little bit about... You had a slide up showing big data, and one of the, the big problems is actually access to that data. Um, is the Research Institute looking for data within the sort of Norwich and wider population, and linking that also to the fact that there is no national database on ME patients, how can we facilitate bringing <coughs> those two things together? So, so there are, uh, first of all, let me say, a lot of people don't like the term big data because it has too many different meanings. But given the broad consensus of what the term big data means, I think one of the things that people do have trouble with is this access question. Now, for many... Um, there are lots of layers. It's like an onion with this in terms of understanding. And you understand, of course, there are lots of levels at which big data can be accessible and can't be because of confidentiality reasons. And so what we're trying to do, one of the things uh, for our new funding stream, we're trying to look at cloud-based computing systems that will have more accessibility. And part of the problem there, though, is about data protection and how we... How we, what the gateways are to those big data systems. So those, I'm afraid, are still works in progress, and we don't have answers for it yet. But I say they are problems we are actively discussing and do want to be able to put in place systems that are appropriate and analyze and have the best data from the best experiments that can be compared across the field. One of the issues you've got in any aspect of science is, as I've said, you have a data set here generated in a lab in California, and another set generated in a lab in Norway or in London. And you can't compare them um, because slight variations in experimental conditions. And that's also true about complications around the way metadata is held and analyzed, even around patient records. So we have to have some understanding of the way we standardize what the data is that goes into the big data sets. Otherwise, it's just meaningless. So there are some fundamental problems to deal with up front before we can move on with really understanding what the big data is. And you hope it often at the turn of the year or earlier? <laughs> so, um, so we hope the building will be done beginning March next year. Okay. Uh, and then we will take possession of the building going forward. There has to be a handover period. I think summer is a sensible time for us to be in and doing stuff. We'll keep the old building going so that there's no downtime, so we'll still be doing research. Then there'll be a mad frenzy of move uh, over a couple of weeks, probably. And then hopefully, touch wood, we'll be up and running. One more question, yes, sir. Could you just flesh out a little bit more about the role of the hospital in all this, in translating or putting into practice what you learn at the Institute? Um, does, that, does it confer... I'm here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, sorry. Does it confer some advantage um, in kind of bypassing NICE? Uh, no, we can't bypass NICE. <laughs> We're kind of distrustful of NICE in this room. Um, okay. Uh, uh, moving on from that, uh, I think one of the things we, we, we have to um, have a solid interaction with the way we work with the clinicians. But part of the problem has been in the language that the clinicians speak and the basic scientists speak 
and the community speak. So what we hope to do by having everyone together in the same building is reduce some of those barriers to communication. And I think that's the most important thing. I think if, if people understand the scale and magnitude and even the nature of the question that people are asking, then I think it's easier to move forward with some of the arguments about progressing the science, both clinical and basic. So the, the, the understanding we've got here is that we'll have patients in. We'll have, we'll have 40,000 um, guys a year having the endoscopies alone. We'll have the people doing clinical trials. So there'll be, the public will be involved in this building alongside the clinicians, alongside the basic scientists. And I think that makes for an area of communication that should actually try and streamline some of those discussion points to move arguments on. Now, I know that's not answered your question, but I think this is an attempt to try and get to the fundamentals about how we can begin to answer the questions. And I think it's all about communicating. I've seen it myself so often. Even the language clinicians use when they're describing clinical trials, when they're describing patient cohorts, are different from those that the public would use and even the basic scientists would use. So I think there has to be a more common understanding about goals, objectives for these translational outputs. Thank you very much, Ian, indeed. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for coming. Maybe just maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just maybe this will be a hub and you'll see the, a, a, a unit somewhere, you know, affiliated to this one when many others in all parts of the United Kingdom have been really nice to have you know, this is a hub and other little centres being developed locally. I'm taken by the proton therapy, which I was once told we couldn't afford in this country because the health service was broke. There, there's going to be six suddenly appearing uh, after millions of pounds have been found from the back of a sofa somewhere, uh, and they're going to have them all over Britain. And I think uh, that was because of patient involvement and uh, publicity and so on. And maybe just maybe that's our kind of thinking. That's our dream, if you like, that we spread this around, but we have to start somewhere learning lessons and make sure we get it right in places like Wakefield and Carlisle and wherever. I mean, that's our dream. So maybe we'll see it, maybe we won't, but by God, we'll keep trying and I'm sure you'll support us. So thank you.